So this uh, concludes our second session. Uh, the last session is really where we want to engage uh, with the audience. Uh, and uh, in addition to the speakers who are already right here on the podium, uh, uh, we also have two uh, experts. Uh, one is uh, Dr. Ralph Hertwich from Daimler, and then uh, Professor Dr. Bloswil from INRET. So I would request both of them to give a 10-minute uh, overview of uh, their perspectives and their experiences, and they will, then we will open up the floor for Q&A. Right. Yes, good afternoon. Um, I guess my role here is to provide a little bit of industry input uh, and perspective on where we see this field going. And actually, when Mohan sent me the invite uh, to do this little presentation, it ended something like this with, more recently, multidisciplinary efforts are seriously considering the issues associated with the development of human-centered systems rather than the only autonomous considerations on intelligent vehicles. Well, for us, as a vehicle manufacturer, that's not a totally new perspective. It is the only perspective that we've been pursuing over the course of the last years. Um, our focus has never been on fully autonomous vehicles. Our focus is really on driver assistance systems uh, in all situations where the driver is not capable of managing a given situation or whether the driver, where the driver is not wanting to control the vehicle and we feel we are able to do it, which is not the case in all different, uh, in all difficult environments, of course. Um, and we have sort of a mantra which says that as long as the driver is theoretically able to control the vehicle, uh, he really should be in control. So that's our perspective, at least for now. The question is, where is this going? Um, and if we want to make some distinction, if we want to split the control task of the vehicle, um, then the first thing I think we should do is look at where is the vehicle good at doing things and where is the driver good at doing things. So the driver, we feel, is particularly good at setting goals for overall tasks, such as deciding where to go. Uh, he's also pretty good at taking risks, and he's good at resolving ambiguity in a complex environment. What the vehicle can do fairly well is stabilize within physical limits. What the vehicle is also able to do is being alert all the time, unfortunately unlike many drivers, and controlling motion within a constrained environment. So if we see these different perspectives, if we see these different abilities, that may give us some guidance on how we split the control task. And then we have an additional really, really hard question to be tackled, and that is, how do we hand over control from driver to vehicle and vice versa? How do we do it today? Well, today, if we look at how the control task is split in the driver assistance systems that we have, we're more or less having the driver and the vehicle operating at the same level. And that is, we have them both doing acceleration and braking, and we have them do the steering. So the driver, typically today in the driver assistance systems that we have, delegates certain subtasks to the vehicle, such as distance control, or lane keeping, or steering to park, if you have one of these um, parking assistance systems. What the vehicle does is it typically warns or intervenes in emergency situations. Emergency braking is one example. Sidewind correction may be another, or these beeping sounds if we go back to the parking example. Now, that's the case today. And we have more or less the same level uh, of, uh, of operation on the driver's side and on the vehicle side. One question that we've been asking as recently is, what would happen if the driver and the vehicle operate at sort of different levels, given the different abilities of control. Um, and that could look as follows, and that's just one hint of what we might be looking for. And 
the driver could operate at the maneuvering level, whereas the vehicle could then stick to these more fundamental notions of translating a certain driving maneuver into acceleration and braking or steering on the other side. Uh, and what we would then have is not that equal operation, but having the driver more or less controlling vehicle motion at a more abstract level, like saying, well, want to have forward motion, or we want to have a lane change, or we want to have a turn, and then let the vehicle translate that high-level command into an actual operation of the vehicle. Uh, and that can either be the execution of the requested maneuver, whenever it's possible, safe, or legal, or it would be an emergency override when there is imminent danger in executing the maneuver. And that would be quite different to what we have today in the driver assistance system. So that might be a perspective that we want to pursue as part of such a program, which puts the human more in the focus of the activity. Um, if we want to do this, it's good to do a reality check. Where do we stand today, especially with these two things that I mentioned here on the right-hand side with the vehicle, either executing certain command or overriding because we have an emergency. So what is established today? As far as maneuver execution, longitudinal control is well established. Um, also, on the emergency override, emergency braking and parallel traffic, that's also well established. So we have all instances where we more or less have longitudinal control of the vehicle. That's, that's pretty much a done deal. Um, what is leading edge today is more or less the lateral control. Uh, and I've got a few examples here with videos. Uh, so this is an example of, of a system that we call stop and go and follow. You've heard stop and go before, and it came out very much to my liking as one of the most desired driver assistance systems. This is sort of our latest version of this, which also includes uh, the lateral control so that you actually follow a leading vehicle, and that's a natural extension. So that's where we are today. Um, also, as far as lateral control is concerned, this is an example uh, that takes you to the stabilization level. This is side wind control, and this is sort of a wind uh, machine here on, on one of our Stuttgart test tracks. The first vehicle you saw going there was affected by the side wind. The second vehicle just uh, uh, took an automated, automatic correction of that side wind via the uh, ESP um, and, uh, and corrected the lateral move of the vehicle. And a final example, more related to uh, the work that we do uh, with our vision systems, uh, is lateral control in areas where it gets really, really very dense to maneuver. And again, that's something uh, that the vehicle is able to do today. Um, what's also leading, uh, leading edge as far as emergency override is concerned, again, has to do with cross traffic rather than parallel traffic and with pedestrians. Uh, here's an example from a demo that will be premiered actually on Wednesday, so you get a sneak preview here. This is the conclusion of one of the major German research projects, uh, which is emergency braking in intersection maneuvers. Uh, from the movement of the camera, you get a feeling on uh, what's happening here. Uh, so the driver uh, is getting into the path of the oncoming traffic, uh, and then uh, the vehicle is stopped. So that's what we can do today there. Um, What's the next challenge coming up on maneuver execution? Um, well, what we see important for this entire notion to split the levels of work between driver and vehicle uh, would be some work uh, that allows us to do lane changes and overtaking in a fairly automated fashion. Um, and as far as emergency override is concerned, evasion maneuvers are where we feel uh, the next challenge lies, and I've got a video on this from where we stand today. You're going to see some pedestrian appearing here, and we automatically initiate an evasion maneuver in that case. So, what are the main issues if we want to pursue this path? We see them in two different domains. The first is HMI, and 
that's really going down to the fact that we, 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 are, we have a pretty much established physical interface with the steering wheel, with the paddles and everything. We don't have an appropriate interface yet for the maneuvering level if we really want to go that way. Yeah? So that's something that we feel as we move along in programs like this uh, is something that needs to be investigated. Um, and of course, these changes from driver to vehicle and vehicle to driver, especially in emergency situations, are a tremendous liability and uh, that also requires more careful investigation on what to do, when to do, and how to do it. And the second big area in order to make all of this work is really environment perception. Um, the range of sensors needs to increase. Uh, we're working here at, at fairly high relative vehicle speeds, line of sight or so. If we want to do something like overtaking maneuvers or so, then that is something that our current sensors can at least not easily do. Not that they're totally unable to do it, but they cannot easily do it. Um, speed of situation analysis is crucial. I mean, you've seen these situations of cross traffic and so on. Um, and we need to really find out where the other vehicles are going. So we need to have some trajectory prediction. And we also need to find out where we are going. So I found some of your videos earlier pretty, uh, pretty good to look at the driver and get some indication also before he actually initiates to do a certain maneuver. That's certainly part of this entire framework. And finally, um, the reliability of perception is key in all of these efforts. And we need to uh, figure out a way uh, how to get a handle on that for us as a vehicle manufacturer. That, of course, is very crucial because redundancy and certification on the one hand side and cost and packaging constraints on the other hand uh, are fairly important compromises in order to put this stuff out on the road. Um, and, of course, liability is our single most important issue because unlike to the great military examples that we saw earlier, uh, we have kind of a different contract with our customers than the Army has with its soldiers. So that's, of course, one of the things. So that's just from my side a, a few hints on where this entire initiative might be looking at. Thank you.